Welcome to a year of operation data and growing in passive solar greenhouses. I'm Amy Ladonsky, SDSU Extension Volunteer Development Field Specialist and Master Gardener Coordinator. Tonight's presentation is part two, the final part of a two-part passive solar greenhouse webinar series. You need not have watched part one in order to gain benefit from tonight's presentation. Part one was recorded and tonight's session will be recorded and posted to SDSU Extension's YouTube page for viewing later. For those of us joining live, uh, if you have questions, please type those questions in the Q&A box. For most of you, that Q&A button will be at the bottom of your screen. If you do not see a Q&A button, you might need to expand your screen view. To begin this evening, we'd like to hear from you. You should see a poll on your screen here momentarily. Do you plan on growing for yourself or your family? to grow plants or produce for sale, or you don't know, or you're not planning on anything at this time. We'll pause here for just a moment, give you a chance to respond. Okay, I think you might be able to see those results. It looks like the majority of you are here today to grow for yourself or your family. Thanks for participating in that. The SDSU Extension Master Gardener Program and the South Dakota Specialty Producer Association is pleased to welcome our presenter, Shannon Mitchell-Kanaus, to present on a year of operation, data, and growing in passive solar greenhouses. Shannon is a mechanical engineer with 20 years of experience doing thermal design, research, and testing of large electronic megasystems. He received a Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Grant to support some of the research and education he's presenting this evening. He also owns and operates a small farm, Wayward Springs, near Brookings, South Dakota. Welcome, Shannon. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Amy. So we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Um, so here's my name. Um, you can see how it's spelled and stuff. That's usually the things people struggle with, uh, pronounced uh, Mitchell Canals. And uh, if you want to, um, you can follow this here URL, take a picture of that with your phone. And that'll take us take you to uh, our Facebook uh, farm page, uh, which is Wayward Springs. A Google search might pull that up too. Uh, so this is part. Of, this is the second part of a two-part uh, series. Uh, first part here we talked about last time, and tonight we'll go through details of my prototype structure. Um, and some analysis of uh, that that I did for um, designing that. Um, and uh, then a review of the 2020 performance data and how that's gone, as well as some of the analysis and the resulting design guidelines uh, that will hopefully be helpful to you if you're looking at uh, building a structure like this of your own. And then if you can take it, make it through the technical boring stuff there, um, I'll talk about some of the different plants and things that we've grown and uh, which ones have done good, things that do differently with those. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, about my research project, uh, my objective is to, to produce some data regarding design trade-offs of passive solar greenhouse features. Uh, so one of the things I've observed is there's really not a lot of good actual data out there. There's a million YouTube videos a bunch of websites and they'll throw out kind of some things that they they found work work nice or or whatever but there's not a lot of real information and real good hard data on this stuff and so that's really what I, I wanted to to see out there was more of this information and so I ended up uh, putting together some of it myself here um, so my motivation is I live in a cold northern climate here in South Dakota by by Brookings which is a a fairly cool region in our state even. Um, and that uh, prevents production of year round crops. And it's so cold that the typical greenhouse structure uh, can be very expensive to operate. And so even a lot of types of produce can't be cost effectively grown in our region uh, without a lot of uh, heating or energy inputs. So what we see is a lot of long distance shipping of fruits and vegetables uh, this time of year, maybe from Central America or South America, um, because we can't grow those kind of things here. And then we have a bunch of things that we can't even get or we've never even heard of. And we'll maybe see a little bit of that later in the presentation, because they're just types of food crops that are 
are delicate, they don't ship well, they don't have a very long shelf life, so they can't make it to our region. So going into some of the prototype details first, what is this structure? What does it look like? Um, so I, I had shared a few pictures uh, last time uh, when we talked about some of the basics of a passive solar greenhouse. Uh, the south side has glazing, north side is insulated uh, because of the direction of our sun in the wintertime. So you kind of see those features here highlighted. Um, the other thing is below the ground, uh, I have, a, I have a poured concrete foundation, which, which you would definitely not have to have. Um, and then you do would need to have insulation here because you're gonna use this ground below the greenhouse as a heat storage system. And so you wanna insulate that so that the heat that you're storing doesn't go out um, into the ground around the structure. So some other key features is have passive intake vents here. Basically these are doors that can be opened in the winter or in the summertime to let uh, cool air in. And then the top vents here um, are also doors that open to let the hot air out so it can move through there uh, and cool the system when it's needed. And then I have the, the climate battery system, which is what's used to store the excess heat that we get during the daytime um, in the ground. So it has a hot air intake here um, in, in the ceiling, blows through the tubes to a fan, uh, which goes then underground through a network of tubes uh, that transfer that heat to the soil, to the ground below the structure, and then it exhausts here on the south side of the structure in, a, in four locations. So we'll, we'll see some more pictures of that here down the road, uh, going into that in, a, in more detail. Uh, remember, last time I kind of introduced folks to what a, a climate or earth battery is and how it functions. Uh, let's just kind of recap this because this is kind of the main point of a lot of the, the details of what's happening here. So first stage during the daytime, we get uh, excess uh, heat um, and from the sun more than our structure can handle, more than our, our crops can handle. And so the strategy with the, this type of system is to capture that heat, to store that heat in a free, cheap storage medium that we have right below us, the ground. And then um, that's done through some air blowing through the tubes. And then at nighttime, then that, uh, that same fan system kicks in and withdraws the heat that we stored uh, during the daytime into the air uh, within our structure. Uh, so it's kind of a, a two phase, two phase, two stage uh, process that goes on with uh, with the climate battery system. So, so that's kind of the fundamentals of how the climate battery system functions. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? Not, not yet. So okay, good. So that's just kind of a really brief recap. Um, so in going into the system in my greenhouse structure a little bit, I've kind of categorized, break down the main components of a climate battery here. And um, what I'm gonna cover in more detail tonight is the ones that are colored brown. So I'll talk a little bit about intake and exhaust manifold layouts, um, heat exchanger tubes, which is what I call the cross tubes crossed here, um, placement of the intakes, um, and then the, the battery insulation system and you know, storage mediums and fans and blowers and thermostats. I won't go into a lot of depth tonight because uh, I don't want everybody to fall asleep because uh, it would get way too long. Uh, but something you can kind of let me know um, too and feedback towards the end, like what things you want to learn more about. We'll have a, a poll later on um, as after we get through some of this stuff. So one of the things I did a good bit of analysis on was looking at different levels of insulation basically that we could do in the, in the foundation here around the greenhouse structure. And really the function of this insulation is to keep the heat that has been stored in the ground within the structure there because um, you don't want to lose that heat because uh, you just paid money to put it there. So this here's an illustration showing um, isotherms. It's called these lines of a constant temperature. Uh, this here's the foundation wall. Um, 
and right here would be the ground or the soil for the battery. In this simulation, it's assuming like the battery temperature is 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and we had an outside air temperature of zero degrees, and then um, your ground temperature down below is our average annual mean ground temperature at the 30-foot level. So we did a bunch of analysis looking at what the equivalent R value is through the foundation system. R values for below ground structures are a little more difficult and more complex than above ground structures because the, the ground temperature changes with depth. Uh, whereas outside above ground, your air temperature outside your walls is constant. So it's, it's not as, as complex to, to do the heat loss calculations. So here I just showed two, two comparisons of two designs uh, with the, the design that I chose for my installation at my location here. Um, which consists of uh, four inches of polystyrene foam board insulation along the foundation wall, and then a two foot uh, horizontal, what's called a frost skirt. You kind of see, see what that looks like here. So I did uh, comparisons on uh, costs and heat loss uh, for a bunch of different variations that someone might choose to do uh, because the design that I have for my system is probably not the right one for you, depending on your climate, because there's a whole bunch of different climates. So as you go farther south, it's not as worthwhile to put as much insulation on. Uh, so just kind of uh, some views here showing what's happening with some different designs. The first one is if you didn't do any insulation, um, you can see the little arrows here point just the direction and flow and the magnitude within this individual image of the amount of heat loss uh, that will be occurring. So you can see that as you add that two inch layer of insulation, that uh, kind of reduces the heat loss in the top. Um, and then the areas that are still your remaining heat loss areas are more so down here through the lower areas and kind of see how that changes as you increase the thickness there. So I went through that and it's like, oh, that's pretty good. But I still see that there's a lot of heat loss happening at the foundation. So I played with a few different um, ways of doing the, the frost skirt. So here's three different configurations that, um, that I chose to put in the, net, in the slide here. Um, I started off with uh, basically a full sheet, be four foot uh, wide, running eight foot the, the long way here. Um, and you can see how that changes uh, the heat path, um, you know, the heat at the, the bottom of your structure. It's really got to go a pretty good distance um, to, to go to the ground where it's colder. And a two foot one, this one here is uh, a pretty good option. I went with this because uh, when you excavate, you probably, depending on how you had it excavated, it's, it doesn't take more excavation costs to fit this guy in here. If you're going to go with this wider four foot frost skirt, you're probably going to have to pay for extra excavation. And that might not make sense for you uh, for the amount of benefit you'll get. And then this design here is actually what's pretty common for frost skirts. Uh, these are the, the frost skirt design itself is originally something that's used in areas where you don't want to dig your foundation below the frost line. So you can basically change what your frost depth is. Um, so you can get a, a cheaper, on, on your home or something, you can uh, get a cheaper construction cost by not having to dig down as far um, into the ground. Uh, so this is actually a, a typical way that a frost skirt might be, be built. And that's because it's got a different function. All it's trying to do in this case is try to keep the, your footings here um, from freezing and causing heaving of your, your foundation. Um, so that what I found in the analysis was that this really didn't give you much energy savings, probably not worth the, the added cost, uh, especially if you would already have dug down, um, you're, you're gonna get much more effective insulation here at this level. So I put X's on here for really three configurations that for most folks, aren't going to be a, a good way to go. Um, and then towards the end of my presentation, I'll give you some guidelines for exactly like what growing zones uh, would benefit from which level of insulation. This kind of gives you a, a feel for some of that background and some of the different um, insulation options there. 
see, so we've got a few questions. Uh, Kent Wilsey asked, do you have spreadsheets or analysis for sizing a heat exchange, et cetera? So I'll cover the things that I do have guidelines for in the presentation tonight. Um, there are areas that uh, definitely more work can, can be done um, in that some of the guidelines that exist today are pretty, mm, pretty old um, and they're there could be better analysis than, than there was. Uh, but you could send me an email to you if you want uh, want some of those legacy spreadsheets out there. I have a, a collection of them. Um, let's see, another question from anonymous attendee. Uh, I don't remember if you told us the length and width of your greenhouse. Yeah, just trying to picture the size. That's a good question. So the size of the structure is a, a 28 foot by 16. Um, so it's it's not uh, not particularly big. Uh, so, yeah. Good and Shannon, question. we did have one more in the chat. Um, okay. Asking you to remind them, Miranda, when did you begin using the greenhouse? How long has it been in hmm. use? Yeah. Yep. That's a good question. Uh, when I come to you sharing the data, um, it'll kind of show that. But I started operation of it where I got everything functional. Uh, January 1st of 2020, so uh, just over a year. Okay, so going into the, the manifold layout stuff a little bit more. Um, so this kind of gives you a little bit of a section view so you can kind of see uh, how these tubes are laid out. So the tubes along the north wall here are all the intake tubes where um, the air goes into the system and kind of a, an air flow pattern here for you as to how it's laid out. So say the air gets sucked in this tube and it's gonna flow into this bottom grid and it's gonna flow through that and then it'll come up and out here in the middle and then it'll get sucked in um, to this, you know, to one of these tubes and it's gonna circulate in a pattern like that so that you get pretty uniform uh, mixing and flow throughout the structure. So the air that maybe just went through the bottom array of tubes, next next time it goes through, it's probably gonna go through the other uh, array of tubes. Um, so that's one thing you wanna do is just get good airflow and mixing um, throughout that system. But another important reason for a layout like this is to help with the distribution of the heat storage when it's going into the ground. So. For example, if you're doing a, you're in the heat withdrawal stage uh, overnight, you're going to have cool air blowing into the tube on this side. And as that air flows through these tubes, it's going to be, be warming up uh, as it takes the heat from the ground. And then it's going to come out the, the corner here warm. Mm -hmm. If you have the layer then below that following the opposite pattern, you're going to get the best heat extraction and storage from the, the thermal mass that you have below the structure. Um, so you want to have those operating in, in op opposite directions uh, to, to get uh, as much uh, heat transfer as you can in and out of the system. So then looking at the, uh, the heat exchanger layout, I did uh, a bunch of different uh, CFD analyses. These are uh, uh, computational analysis uh, that's done to simulate the airflow uh, within a system um, before you build it. So I've got here on the right, is kind of a, a picture of what it looks like when it was installed. And the view on the left here is uh, a screenshot from the simulation showing basically this grid of tubes, but from the bottom. And so the air is coming in on the intake here, flowing through the manifold and going around, um, around the bend and through these, uh, the heat exchanger tubes here. And what you, what you want your system to have is a, a uniform or maximized um, airflow through all of the tubes, because if you have some of your tubes not getting as much airflow, you're not going to get as much heat transfer through it. And so it's, this actually is a pretty complex thing to do to, to get these uniform. And I'll show you a few 
um, other simulations with just a few little tweaks and show how it how it impacts uh, that. Uh, so did did other simulations um, to to evaluate the heat transfer rates along the tubes to the sto soil storage system, um, calculating the pressure drop curves that is essential to selecting the right size fans. I won't go into that tonight. Um, and then I did other simulations looking at the heat loss rates through the building structure uh, as well to, to look at the different uh, building structure um, options that are out there. So looking into tube layouts a little bit more, um, this is actually what I, I started out with, maybe being a, uh, an intuitive thing to do. So I just have a, a T fitting, it's pretty easy to get in for tubes um, and just have the, the intake and the exhaust come into a T fitting uh, in, in the manifold. What, what you see happens if you do that is this tube here right beside that uh, T it doesn't get any airflow, basically kind of gets starved of air because the velocity of air is coming in such that its inertia carries it past that tube. And so you end up really with one, one dead cross tube in, in the system if you're, you're using a T like that. So I was like seeing that, I was like, oh, okay, that's not good. So then uh, put in uh, the 90 degree elbow here in the end so that all there's kind of moving together, not quite as, as um, turbulent and barreling past the, the first tube as quickly there. You'll see, of course, there's still uneven flow across these. This is actually pretty good. It would be a lot worse, say, if you put this tube in the middle and this tube in the middle, then really all your airflow is going to try to, to go down these, these middle tubes and you're not going to get airflow out the end one. So um, putting them at the corners is really a key thing that's it's free to, to put them there. You don't have to put any other any other features in. Um, so that's a, it's a, a good thing to do with your layout. But really what happens is the amount of air flowing through the tubes down here decreases, which makes there less uh, less friction. So, it ends up not having as much uh, frictional losses to take this these routes and you get more airflow um, along to the other side. So one thing that was also free to do actually a little bit of cost savings was to use um, this this here's four inch pipe. I think I'll cover that later, but this is a four inch tube and then this manifold here in the simulation is a is an eight inch tube. So really what you want to do is create a little bit more friction in these end tubes um, so that it will choose to take these other ones first. And so you can do that by stepping down to a smaller diameter tube here at the end uh, so that this one is a little bit more length to it, a little bit more resistance, and you'll get a pretty good um, airflow through all of these. Still some area for improvement, uh, but something you can do without any added extra cost. Um, so looking at the tube layout themselves, these cross tubes, um, as well as the, uh, the manifold tubes are a four inch corrugated perforated pipe. Uh, you wanna make sure that that pipe is, is a perforated uh, because when the air is flowing through this, you're gonna get a lot of humidity uh, condensing out of the air as it flows through the cool ground. And you want that water to be able to drain out of your tube so they'll, they'll fill up with uh, condensate from your, your air. So what I did is I buried the, uh, the bottom layer here is four foot below um, grade and the second layer is, is two foot and really all of the tubes across here are spaced at uh, two foot intervals uh, from each other. Um, yeah, I think that covers most of this. Um, what is the best tube spacing? I think this is still a, a good question. I, I did two foot and I think the findings I have is that I should have put them closer together and it'll kind of go into some of the data and why uh, a little bit later. Of course, there's a trade-off to putting a, too many tubes. Of course, the tubes cost money themselves, uh, but they do also displace more of your storage medium of the, the soil that you're putting your heat into. So you don't want to have just tubes and no ground. So uh, it's something to, to take into account there. Uh, so just kind of a couple of views of what these look like and how I put together. 
I, I ended up just uh, taking a, a four inch hole saw basically and cutting uh, that hole into the manifold tube. Um, and they kind of snap in there. And then just to fill in the little bit of gaps, cracks, I use the little expanding foam stuff you can put around the, to fill the seams. So that kind of goes through the, the building of the uh, tubes and manifold stuff. Uh, if anyone had any questions, not see any questions on that yet. Oh, we got one uh, from Matt. Would there be any additional benefit to stepping the tube size down more to get the airflow to be more uniform? Yeah, that's a good good question, Matt. And I think I think there is opportunity for that. Um, one thing that I ended up doing when I built this, I I uh, couldn't get um, the eight inch manifold tube wasn't just off the shelf um, at my local Lowe's here in town. So I ended up using six inch instead of eight inch. And unfortunately, because I did that, I did end up losing a lot of airflow volume that I could have gotten. Um, but it would be feasible to do uh, more steps down. So like if you had an eight inch, you could step down to a six part way across um, and then step down to a four. Uh, but I don't have have simulations of that and, and uh, calculations in, in here for you on that. Um, Art and Mary asked, why not use covered perforation tubes? Yeah, um, you could use them. They You can buy these with uh, a little, um, like a sock, uh, they call it, that goes over the tube. And the purpose of those socks is to, if you're doing it, using it as a drain tile, you're putting them in a very wet location where you're expecting a lot of water to flow from, from the ground outside into the tube um, and, and out of your field or, or your eaves, downspouts, whatever. So you're expecting a lot of volume of water. Um, and I, I wasn't expecting to have water flowing from outside into the tubes in any sort of volume. Of course, there's a little bit because I water the plants above it, um, as well as it depends on your soil type, you know. So if you do have a lot of fine, uh, fine soils that might get washed into those perforations, you might want to buy these with the socks. But the socks do add a little bit of cost. Um, so if you don't need them, um, you, you wouldn't need to to put them on there. So. So now I'm going to go into 2020 performance data and how this thing worked. So it ended up that uh, in February here, um, our coldest day of the year ended up being February 13th. Um, so I have that an illustration here of data from February 13th beside February 12th, which were nice contrasting days with some very different weather. Um, so the first plot here shows the amount of solar radiation uh, from the sun uh, shining uh, directly from the south onto the structure. So the first day here was a, a cloudy, warm day. Uh, we got up to 340 watts per meter squared, not a whole lot. And this little green bar shows that the fans kicked in to store heat during that little bit of time period or got warm enough uh, to store heat for that little bit. And then the red column here shows time when the system began to withdraw heat uh, to, to keep the structure warm inside. So the second day was a, a clear day, uh, clear and sunny. Um, so we got up to 647, uh, which is not as high as you can get, but, but pretty, pretty good, pretty clear. Um, so inside the greenhouse, our temperatures on that first day um, were steady, went up to 67 degrees Fahrenheit uh, or 19 Celsius. And then our outside temperatures here is for, for February is pretty, pretty nice, really. 29 degrees Fahrenheit, just, just a little bit below freezing. Um, but then you see overnight, our weather got pretty cold um, and we got down to 23 degrees uh, negative 23 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is minus 30 Celsius. Um, so that was our, our coldest night. And kind of see how that how the temperatures in the greenhouse fared. It, uh, it did get down to 38 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, uh, but that's uh, well above freezing yet. And once the sun comes out, um, it heats up fast and 
uh, we got up to, to 98 degrees, uh, even with the, the fans trying to store as much heat as they could, as fast as they could. Um, so it's pretty, pretty warm and, and it was still pretty cold out. Um, so you kind of see here the fans that I have for, for um, the four of them, I have one for each, each of the uh, arrays of tubes. Uh, the total is 3.3 uh, amps. And I just have that shown here. You can kind of see when, when they kick in and off. Um, and then I calculated here the amount of sensible heat transfer um, in the system. So when it with, was withdrawing heat, uh, we're withdrawing um, 7,000 uh, BTU per hour. So if you were looking at sizing a heater or is the equivalent of that, um, that's, that's kind of a nice reference point. And then when it's storing heat, uh, we get hit a peak storage uh, rate of 19,000 BTU per hour, which is pretty good amount. So the total energy cost for running the fans these two days uh, it was 20 cents this day of uh, electricity just to run the fans uh, versus 77 cents, which is practically they're running um, about as much as you would see in a day, or there's really just a short period of, of on and off in between storage and withdrawing. So comparing that to uh, a traditional greenhouse of the same size um, to keep it these same temperatures uh, when it was heating, you would spend $5.40 of propane uh, to heat a structure that was glass or a single layer of six mil polyethylene. Um, or if you had this exact same structure as I have uh, and you were using propane as your heat source, uh, you would spend $2.11 uh, for this day um, to heat that uh, equivalent structure. Uh, let's see, so we do have one question from Tiffany Vincent. What did you see over the course of several cloudy days versus the data with the cloudy day followed by the sunny? Exactly, great question. We will cover that in a future slide uh, when we look at uh, more days. Um, so this here's uh, another example from a little bit later in the year. This is in, in March. And I thought I'd show you guys this profile because it shows um, a few different things operating. So um, we have the, the temperature here is this, this darker blue line. And you can see here overnight, um, it cools off and it got to a point where the fans kicked in to extract heat. Uh, you see the fan cycled on, in this case, it cycled on three times uh, to keep it above the, the temperature set point that I had. Uh, looks like I had the thermostat set at like 50. Um, at that, uh, at that stage. And then it, it, the temperatures in there ramp up when the, the sun comes out on a pretty good steady path. This was a, a not cloudy day, so it follows a nice even route. And then when you get to the point here where the fans kick in to store heat, it basically changes the, the rate that things are warming up in there. Um, so you could say they would have continued on that path approximately for, for a while till it would start to, to level out more, uh, whereas the batteries really kind of temper that um, I had these set at 75 degrees during this, this period of time. And then at this point I had the, the vent doors that uh, I talked about on the top of the structure. Um, they're on these uh, linear actuators um, that open and close them with a thermostat. And at this time of the year, it's pretty cool outside. So you wouldn't wanna just open those and leave them open all day um, because it would cool off uh, probably too much in there. Um, so they cycle open and close uh, probably three times, maybe four times here over, over that time to, to keep it below what I had them set at, which was like 90, 93 um, at that point in time. Um, so it just kind of gives you a view of, of uh, what that daily profile would look like. So then, let's see, oh, we do have a question. Oh, well, I have, that's the same one. Are the heat exhaust panels on the top clear to let in light or are they solid? Matt, Matt asked if uh, those doors are, are clear. They are, they are solid. Um, they are actually like uh, standard house doors. I, I went with that because they have a decent R value and I didn't have to, to fabricate something of potentially shoddy craftsmanship. Um, and I had so much other stuff I was making, so. I, uh, I just bought regular doors 
um, which have a decent insulation value, about an R8. Um, and they're not super heavy because um, they're the foam, foam core stuff. So, you know, that's what I use for those doors. Um, yeah, this, this slide maybe shows, shows kind of some pictures of those that are a little bit nicer uh, for you. Um, so here's a graph showing all of 2020. So um, so maybe a lot of information on here. Um, the solid dark line here shows what the temperature, the average daily temperature in the greenhouse uh, with the red and the blue being the daily extremes that occurred. The dotted line then is our outdoor temperatures and the daily extremes that we had outdoors. So kind of some key points of interest on here. I just got the system functioning really. It was on January 1st here where I got the wiring done and got the thermostats and fans functioning. So um, I didn't have any pre-existing heat stored in the ground above what would naturally be there in January weather. Um, so basically you can say I started with the, the battery empty or uh, the bank account was empty uh, for heat at that uh, point in time. So it was in January, actually January of last year was the cloudiest on record. Uh, this January seemed pretty cloudy too. Uh, I don't know if it was more or less, but um, the coldest point that I seen um, of the flow year was uh, 29.1 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and I guess I was, I thought that was really promising because I didn't have any pre-existing heat stored and we had very little amounts of sunlight. Um, so um, I thought that was a bit surprising that I didn't see freezing sooner. Uh, but it really was only, only that, uh, that one, one night. Um, so, you know, other things of note, um, by February, these temperatures are, daily temperatures are getting pretty warm in here, really unsafe uh, for plants and, and maybe for humans in, uh, in February, getting above 100. Um, I didn't have the, the vents and stuff functioning yet. Um, I was just here and just at the, the end of February, early March. Uh, where I got those um, automated and I set them at 90 to, to open at 90 degrees. You could set them, you know, at 80 or something as well, and then it would would keep it uh, down to that temperature. But uh, you do want your air temperatures to be um, warm for as long as you can in there because your fans are, are trying to capture that heat and store it into the ground. Um, so uh, that's that's kind of why I had it set at that at uh, 90 degrees. Depending on what you're growing, you, you might want to, to do that differently. Um, so um, maybe kind of step in, jumping farther along. I was, I was kind of surprised. I, I uh, automated the opening of the top vents because they're hard to get to and not something you want to do manually. Um, but the lower vents, I just left those um, being something you could open and close manually. And I wanted to see really how long I could go without using them. And I really ended up only using them for a short period of time in August here. Um, so the amount of cooling that we've seen all through maybe before this kind of controlling these upper temps is all just the top doors opening and closing as well as the fans circulating through the ground uh, to um, store heat or to cool uh, the structure. So I really only use those for about 20 days, which makes it pretty questionable as to whether or not they're worth it to, to put on there. Um, that's one of the things I'd do differently. I probably wouldn't wouldn't make this uh, this knee wall structure on here, and I would use uh, a shade cloth or something instead uh, to reduce uh, those those extreme temperatures during the summertime. Um, so that would also be a, a passive solution. The the big drawback to the knee wall is that in the winter time it does cast a shadow on uh, parts of your growing area. So if you have plants that are short to the ground, um, they're not going to get as much light. Especially if you were growing lettuces or something like that on the ground, uh, that that's a, that's an issue. I do have a lot of plants and pots that are on tables, um, so for them it's it's not really a, 
a, a big of an issue. Um, so it's a little bit covered here with outdoor temperatures. Uh, this fall, um, if you remember, we kind of got some cold temperatures pretty early and uh, some, some snowstorms. Uh, but here starting um, late September, uh, it was maintaining uh, 60 degrees in the structure um, really throughout this time period here um, until you know, late October, uh, beginning of November here, where we got this pretty long duration uh, cold spell where we got down um, about down to 10, 10 degrees or so. Um, so uh, when, when that came around, it really couldn't keep up uh, with the, the heat that uh, was being stored. So then I set the thermostat down to, uh, to 50 degrees uh, here in, in the beginning of, of November, which is still really good for growing most types of things. So um, that, that, was, that was great. And so then it maintained uh, a lower temperature of 50 degrees um, every day up until um, mid, uh, mid December here. Uh, and then I set the thermostat down to, to 45. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a, an overview of the temperatures inside for, for the year. Um, and then just looking at what the total operating cost uh, for the system, which is, is all electricity for the fans, uh, was a total of $131 um, or 29 uh, cents per per square foot of uh, structure. So let's see any questions. Michael McNamara has a question. I'm interested to see what the temperature would be completely passively, uh, meaning not using any thermal systems and just using the solar heat. Yeah, I I, I didn't have all the temperature sensors um, functioning. Um, but I did have I did have a few in December, like while I was still working on wiring and not having things operate. And I would say I've seen some temperatures above 130 degrees Fahrenheit in there. Um, it, was, it was it was too hot, <laughs> too hot to work in there. That's for sure. Um, so, yeah, it can get very hot in your greenhouse without uh, without any any ventilation or without the, the fans to circulate the, the temperatures through the soil. Um, I did put this, this slide in here. Um, maybe you know, if folks want to come back to it, it has the outdoor temperatures removed from it. So it's a little bit easier to see uh, what the greenhouse temperatures ended up being. Um, this could be nice to look at, um, you know, if you're looking at various kinds of crops and want to know what temperatures uh, you could expect and what, uh, what would grow best when. You know might be useful. So I just put that on here, the separate chart for everybody. Um, so looking more into the, the, the battery storage system, I have, I have a few sensors down into the soil, into the ground to monitor what the temperatures are down there and to see what's going on. So in general, what we would expect, if this is a top-down view of the structure, um, when it's cold outside, you're going to have heat loss through the outside uh, foundation. And you'll see a, a general temperature gradient where it's warmest in the middle, and then along the outside walls are going to be the coolest part of the storage battery. Um, so I have sensors um, at these two locations, one in the middle to see what the warmest spot is, and one that I thought was a reasonable approximation of a, a coolest uh, location. So here's, here's what those, that temperature looks like uh, for those two positions at the, the four foot depth of the, uh, the battery. So we started off um, January here at uh, about 45 degrees. Um, this is actually right, right in line with those geothermal graphs I showed last time. Uh, so that's kind of neat. Um, I'm going to see we got to a, a peak temperature here in early August of uh, 73 degrees. Um, and then, yeah, and then at the end of the year down to 52. So um, warmer than 45, uh, but not, uh, not hugely warmer. Um, some, some other interesting things that you can see in the data here is, is during the first period of time, we really don't see a lot of temperature gradient or difference between 
the middle position um, and along the wall. Um, but once you get to the second half of the year uh, where it's colder outside uh, than your structure, that's when you start to see a bigger difference uh, between the center of your, your earth um, and, and the outside. So that's, that's probably what, what, uh, what I was expecting, I guess. Um, that that's kind of gives you a perspective of that. So um, I also measured at multiple depths to see how the system was was functioning for like say the top array versus the, the bottom set of tubes. So uh, this here is a graph of um, these two positions, uh, the two foot and the four foot depth along that, that outer wall um, over the course of the year. So you can see uh, maybe an interesting pattern during the summertime, uh, the, the two foot depth tubes are noticeably warmer uh, than the bottom set of tubes. So you have heat conduction happening through the earth uh, downwards, like, like you would expect. The, the deeper earth temperatures are probably well below 70 degrees. Um, so your, your bottom set of tubes here at the four foot depth are able to provide a greater amount of cooling uh, than the tubes that are only two foot. So sometimes people were like, ah, can I just get by with two foot depth tubes? Like, well, your two foot ones aren't going to have the same level of performance as four foot ones. Um, and you can kind of see that that here. That's so really, yeah, here's kind of just an overlay of what that temperature gradient looks like during the summertime. Now it's interesting is that starts to flip uh, by the time you get to December. And if I had January's data on here from, from this year, you see that as well, where the uh, the, the deeper temp the deeper uh, soil probes uh, end up being warmer uh, than the ones higher up. And that, that makes sense because now that you're getting lower, the ground temperature below you, you've been kind of artificially manipulating it all summer, got stuff warmed up more than it would naturally be. And you'll see uh, basically heat conducting up this way. So um, it actually, when you're withdrawing more heat than you've been storing into the battery, it starts to function more like the low grade geothermal type of system uh, that I talked about uh, previously. So it's interesting. So you might think, oh, what's my battery is empty. It's empty. It's not exactly what happens. It actually ends up being able to provide you with some amount of continuous heat, basically equivalent or probably a little bit better than uh, a low grade geothermal would be um, because you've been dumping heat into this, this area um, throughout the year. Uh, some other things you can see in the data that are interesting. This here, uh, if you remember from our weather data, this was when we had that, that cold spell. Uh, and I can see the, uh, the, the dark lines here is the top array of tubes. Those tubes dropped cooler faster. And then once uh, the sun returned after that uh, cold weather, it rebounded as well, um, 14 degrees, whereas the four foot tubes, they didn't get heated up again um, as much as, as they were before. Um, so it's really just, it's more stable, uh, basically a more damped uh, system, um, the deeper you go. Um, so, you know, maybe in summary, the shallow tubes provide you faster heating and cooling, but the deeper tubes provide you longer, larger quantities of heating and cooling. So, um, having two layers is helpful. Uh, some folks I've seen would do even more than two, um, two to, to three or something. Um, and that's, that's a cost trade off because you got to go deeper and you got to put more into to making that. Uh, let's see, so we had a couple of questions from Tiffany asked, are you running home built electronics and sensors for your monitoring uh, like a Raspberry Pi or Arduino? That would be fun, but I was building so much stuff for this already that I went uh, with a commercial off the shelf product. Um, so I, I use a, a, a temperature, well, it's a, it's a monitoring system from a company called iMonit. 
And uh, I went with that because they offer a lot of different type of sensors that all function on the same system. So we've got temperature, uh, humidity, um, current monitoring, and they have a bunch of others if, if I wanted um, as well. Um, see, Michael McNamara asks, would the, would the SIR temps be the same with using planter boxes colder near the wall? Air. Oh, would the air temperatures be the same uh, with planter boxes near the wall? Um, the air temperatures, I think, would be the same, but you might see that the soil in your growing boxes would be would be different um, if you're growing growing up off the ground. the The fans do uh, a pretty good amount of airflow, so it's it's mixed well throughout the structure, and there's uh, not very much of a temperature gradient. We'll touch on on the temperature gradient a little bit more later. And Matt asks, do you think the current system is limited by the heat capacity of the soil or would increasing airflow speed or even finding tubes that could transfer heat more efficiently help store more heat and or even help reduce the daytime high temperatures in the winter? That's a great question, Matt. And we will cover that in the next slide where I did some studies changing the airflow rates. Um, and Anne Marie asks, are there plans for this build? Um, I don't have um, prints or anything, um, but uh, you can send me an email um, with uh, questions or uh, something like that. And I can point you to, there's a few places that do have some plans that are similar um, or could help you out with something. Um, let's see, so I think that that covers all those questions. Um, on to the next slide. Okay, so this here is actually what I was most excited about and what I was really looking for um, in data was how much heat could the system um, be counted on to supply and or cool. Um, so if if you're maybe not familiar with uh, heating and cooling, these, these numbers aren't be as interesting to you, but um, this year shows for the full year from January through December, the amount of heat um, that the, the system supplied each day, and then the amount of cooling that the system provided each day uh, in a kilo BTU. Um, Maybe for reference for folks that aren't familiar with it, I threw in this this reference. Everybody knows a propane can for your grill. Uh, a 20 pound propane tank holds uh, 433 uh, kilo BTU. So I like could say if you're you got uh, 50 uh, kilo BTU days of heat, um, this tank holds holds four days of a, a 50 50 bar height here. So it's interesting as we kind of look at the, the patterns and the data here, we see that uh, in the springtime when um, the ground is cool, it can really absorb quite a lot of heat. Um, so, so that's not surprising, but uh, I was maybe surprised a little bit just by the magnitude of uh, heat storage or cooling that it could provide. Um, that would be a, an expensive air conditioner to do that. Of course, a fan just blowing air outside is is uh, capable of something a lot more than this. Um, by the summertime, the the bit of the ground, of course, to provide cooling does diminish a good bit, and the so so the the height of these bars uh, shrinks quite a bit during the summertime as you've uh, filled up the soil with heat. And uh, once you have heated up that soil. Um, you are able to get more heat extraction um, as you need it um, in the fall um, and through the winter, uh, which is maybe not too surprising. That's the general trends maybe they would expect. Uh, but what these numbers do is if you're designing the structures or building, this gives you a feel for how much insulation is worthwhile in your structure because you would be able to rely on the system to provide uh, this amount of heating and cooling. Uh, which is really numbers I was looking at or looking for, um, trying to know what is the right way to design the structure. 
how much insulation in the walls is, is worthwhile. So um, maybe breaking down the, uh, the total heat, uh, there's, it's really a combination of two, two types of heat, um, both sensible heat. Um, sensible heat is the energy that's required to heat the air um, without any condensation or evaporation taking place. So basically you blow air in at uh, 10 degrees, it comes out at 20 degrees, that's you know, how much heat's been transferred through their sensible heat transfer. Uh, the other key metric um, is condensation and evaporation. And that's what uh, latent heat is, is energy change due to you blew humid air in, uh, some of the moisture in that humid air condensed into the tubes, that takes a lot of energy for that to occur. And so uh, that's really what latent heat transfer is. So you'll see that uh, the latent tra heat transfer is actually fairly significant, especially in the, the cooling um, aspects of the, the operation of the system. Um, not, not as much in, in the heating. Um, this was interested in because you see some, some folks saying, well, you gotta have a runs of 20 foot or greater tube length in order to allow time for latent heat transfer condensation to occur and become significant. And I guess I can't really say that's what I observed. Um, my tubes are 14 foot um, and I've seen pretty good amounts of uh, latent heat transfer condensation evaporation occurring uh, within those lengths of tubes with the air flows that I had. Um, let's see, one question here from Kathy. This is a, this is a good question, a lot of folks Ask this one: um, Do you anticipate any mold growth, et cetera, in the tubes that could cause health concerns? Um, I didn't have any way to monitor this myself, uh, but the University of Minnesota folks have done some studies on this, um, measuring um, the air coming out of climate batteries in the deep winter greenhouses, and they have found in general that the air coming out is cleaner than the air going in. Um, in all of the studies that they've done. And you know, maybe that's because the airflow rates are, are pretty high. Um, molds probably can't grow well uh, when the air is flowing um, like that. I'm not sure, but I would say it always smells good. It smells nice and fresh. Um, so that's what, that's the monitoring system I have. Uh, but uh, yeah, there have been studies on that. It's a good question. Okay. so. Someone had asked earlier about fan speeds um, and the effect that that had. So I uh, made sure that I had uh, fully speed controllable fans so that I could could do these this type of study. And so what I have here is uh, three different speeds. Uh, when my fans are running at full speed, um, they move uh, 800 uh, some here CFM of air through the system. Um, in total. This is the, the air uh, volume measured coming out of the tubes. Uh, it's important that these are not what's on fan ratings. Those are, those are different and that's never what you would get in the real system uh, when it's hooked up. Um, so uh, that's maybe where fan sizing and stuff comes in. Um, but uh, this is what the actual airflow is through the system at full speed. Uh, the 439 is at half speed and 700 is at uh, 75%. Um, so what this graph here is showing is with the temperature difference from the battery to the air. Uh, so mostly it's uh, during the day as it gets hotter in the structure, uh, how the heat transfer rates will change. So if you have a, a ground to air temperature difference of 10 degrees, um, you'll, you'll see um, you know, I don't know, maybe 4,000 here uh, BTU per hour of heat transfer. And so, of course, at the, the lower uh, delta T air temperature differentials, you're not going to see a lot of difference with fan speeds. Uh, but as you increase basically the temperature of the air in the greenhouse during the day as it gets hotter, you're going to see more benefit from higher uh, fan flow rates. Uh, and these here look to be pretty linear for the, 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 the variation of uh, ambient conditions I was able to capture uh, during that, uh, that study. 
Um, one thing that's important is uh, the efficiency of the system. Um, and so that, that follows the same pattern, but inversely. Um, so for heat exchangers, their efficiency is measured uh, with what's called the coefficient of performance, a COP, which is basically uh, the energy um, that you're getting out of the system, the beneficial energy you're getting out of the system versus the energy you're putting into the system. So in this case, that's the, the heating or the cooling energy divided by the energy to operate the fans. Um, so this gives, this maybe isn't super helpful for folks unless you're trying to compare these to a, another type of heat exchanger or heat pump. Um, those are all rated in COP as well. And uh, a heat pump system, they usually have COPs that are sub 10. Um, so um, these systems, you do get a lot of um, energy stored and extracted uh, without a lot of energy uh, to operate it. Um, maybe something to note here that, that is a little bit helpful if you're trying to figure out what your thermostat settings, which ones, what might be useful. Um, if you know what your soil or your battery temperature is, now really if your, your temperature difference between your internal air and your storage system is three degrees or you know, maybe even five degrees, it, it might not be worth running the system. Um, so because your efficiencies are, are getting pretty low. So that's kind of a one guide that you can kind of come out of that uh, with. So let's see, any questions on fan speed that kind of answer questions that folks had? So looking at some um, design guidelines next. Um, so this is uh, for the insulation levels we talked about earlier. Uh, so I, I did this study here looking basically using the um, the USDA hardiness zone map uh, because I figure most folks that are growing plants might be growing greenhouses are very familiar with this way of categorizing uh, your, your growing region versus um, some other climatic map types. Um, so basically with the, the data that I had from the insulation analysis, and the data from the amount of heat that was able to capture and store in the climate battery, it can put together uh, what the return on investment would be for folks to put in different um, insulation types for their different regions. So across the top here, we show how many years um, it would take to get a return on investment, um, basically assuming that the heat you lose through your foundation, you might have to make up for uh, with propane heating, uh, which would be $1.30 per gallon is, is my average cost uh, over several years. If you're using a different heat source like um, electricity, it's gonna be more expensive than that. You would see a faster return. If you're cutting your own wood and firing your own thing there and your heating costs are, are, are free, um, then that's different. But um, this is the assumptions there. And, if, and I figured if you're getting a return investment, you know, four years or less, it's probably pretty reasonable. More than four is kind of questionable. Um, so basically, if you're in zone th 3B or 4B, um, this, this year design system, uh, which would be design D here, would be a pretty good option for you. Uh, if, uh, you know, if you're not able to store as much heat, or if you have a better insulated structure, you know, it, it could vary a little bit, but this is just to kind of give people a, a ballpark guideline uh, of what, uh, what might be a, a good decision for their, their region, their climate. Um, if you're in zone 5B, which, which I, wish, I wish I was, um, but I'm not, um, a four inch uh, insulation layer might be, might be good for you. You see this one here, it's, it's kind of in that marginal period where, eh, you know, maybe Maybe going with a two inch um, might make more sense. Uh, that's kind of up to your, your individual application, what you think. Um, and, and definitely if you're in, in 6B, um, two inches is definitely sufficient. Um, and I figure if you're below 6B, a lot of the time the structure is gonna be used for cooling, not so much for heating. So uh, you might not want insulation um, if you're in a warmer climate than that. Uh, my focus was kind of on our north central uh, USA region. Um, anyone have any questions on 
on those guidelines. I don't see any. Um, another really good question is what's the right heat exchanger tube length? Um, so what, what I had built was 14 feet of length. And so I did some work to see basically how effective that would be. Um, efficacy is, is a metric for heat exchangers, um, which basically looks at how effective the heat exchanger is at getting the fluid temperature, the air temperature that you're passing through it down to uh, the soil temperature in this case. Um, so this is what this here plot shows. So across the bottom is the same as before is the, the uh, ground temperature uh, minus the, the incoming air temperature. Um, so basically over here is hotter in the greenhouse uh, relative to the ground. And then this is how far off the uh, temperature coming out of the tubes was uh, from that ground temperature. Um, so say that the air going in is 15 degrees above the ground temperature, the air coming out, if you're running at the higher fan speeds, was four degrees above the ground temperature uh, versus a slower speed is, is uh, closer to three degrees. Uh, but overall, I was pretty happy with, um, with how well it was uh, transferring heat um, to the ground. That was really, uh, I was actually a little bit surprised with, the, with how well that was doing. Um, but if you're comparing this to your own system, if you had all this, this data, you know, lower um, is better here. You want to, to have your outgoing air as close as possible um, to the battery, because that means you have transferred all the heat that you put into, that the air is putting into the system, you transferred all that to your storage system. Um, and so, so you want to get that as, as low as you can. Um, it's it's desirable to keep your tube length short uh, because the longer you're, longer it is, uh, it, it takes more friction. It takes more fan power to to blow the air through that. Um, so you want to keep it short, but yet you want it long enough that you allow the air to dwell in those tubes long enough to transfer the heat. Tubes that are too long will transfer all of the heat to the soil um, before passing the full length. That's also a bad thing. So, you know, if this was zero, all of the air, you know, the air coming out is exactly at the ground temperature, that's also probably a bad thing because that means that it, um, it transferred all the heat and then it didn't do anything for the rest of the time it was traveling through the tubes. So and if you see someone with tubes that are 50 foot, 100 foot long, that, that, that's probably not a, a very efficient system um, because it's, it's going to have uh, transferred all of it, its heat much, much sooner. Um, it does depend on um, the, the airspeed uh, that's flowing through that, though. Um, overall, the 14 foot performed well. Um, I think more length is, is fine, uh, but you wouldn't want to get it a lot longer, you know, maybe staying under 30 feet. And that kind of aligns with some of the other stuff. An example I've seen people saying um, when they've tried these in various situations. Any, anyone have any questions on uh, the heat exchanger tube lengths? Okay, um, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, intake. So I started off um, um, having it uh, up top here. Um, I was thinking, you know, hot air rises, right? This is gonna be the warmest part um, in your house or someplace like that, that is the case. Um, but I observed that the intake air temperature was substantially lower, um, especially during the times when I was storing heat um, than the, the main temperature sensor I had um, in the structure at about a four foot height. Um, so I was like, hmm, that's kind of um, not what I was expecting. Um, so I installed sensors at a few different heights here so you kind of see what that profile looks like. So at basically one foot off the ground, um, it's kind of zero. Um, and this is the temperature increase as you increase your elevation off the ground. Um, so at a sensor at four foot, that was probably about the peak of the warmest. You know, maybe it's somewhere in here. I didn't have enough sensors to, to do all those. Um, and it really just kind of flattened out. And really what, what's happening is you're getting enough airflow 
um, in the structure that you, stratification doesn't occur, uh, which makes sense because you, you've got uh, a fair number of fans um, moving air in here. So if you want to add cost to run your tubes all the way up to the top, that's it's not worth it to, to, to do that. Um, so you know, keeping it around uh, four foot or six foot uh, is, is a pretty good guide for, for most folks. Uh, so what I ended up doing was was changing that. Um, so I just had the intake here um, at about uh, head level at six foot. Um, so that's that's uh, it was an interesting thing. Um, anyone have any questions about that? Um, so there's some other things that I do differently. Um, someone else asked about this. I would decrease the spacing between the heat exchanger tubes. I, I had them two foot on center, um, just because I've seen that as an example of what some folks um, have done. Uh, but really what I observed through this is that, especially that would help with the, the uh, daytime extreme temperatures to have them closer together. Um, you'd be able to store the heat faster uh, during the intense sunny days uh, without venting as much of it. Um, I would probably keep the, the depth for the first layer uh, two foot below um, the soil um, because you know, if you do go with a tiller or uh, something like that, if you're working the soil or planting things, you don't want to have to deal with running into your pipes and damaging something. Um, so maybe keeping the top layer two foot below, but then keeping your spacing uh, something less. Uh, that's something I would do differently uh, next time. I don't have uh, detailed calculations and illustrations for you on what that should be, uh, but that would be a fun project. Um, and the manifold tubes, uh, someone mentioned this too, you know, reevaluating those diameters uh, to get uh, more even pressure drop and distribution. Uh, that, that's an area for improvement. Um, also consider less perforated manifold. So what I observed, I, the CFM measurements that I had there is the air coming out of the tubes. I noticed probably 25% um, difference between the volume of air going into the tubes versus air coming out. So what that means is that there is there's some amount of air that's going um, through the perforations and taking a different path uh, back to the return of the fans. And so um, the, the Intake manifold is where the highest pressure is. So you get the most bang for your buck if you used a, a PVC pipe, for example, instead of a perforated manifold. Uh, you probably would still want to drill a few drain holes in it um, so you didn't have water accumulating in that, uh, but then you wouldn't see air leaking. I'd, along the north wall, I noticed um, when, I water, when I water plants, if the fans are on, uh, there'll be a, little, a few bubbles uh, coming up through the water along the foundation. That's really, then you can kind of visually see, oh, I got a little bit of air um, leaking here, taking a bit of a shortcut uh, to get back. So if, you're, if your soil is, is damp, um, you're gonna have less air leaking um, than, than when it's uh, more porous. And so, and notice that the, the soil along that north wall too dries out quicker um, and it takes more watering uh, because of that, so. Would be something too that uh, I do differently. Um, mentioned earlier, I'd, I'd eliminate the knee wall and those intake vents on the bottom. Um, it'd give me better uh, ground level light during the winter time. I did notice when I had the the, the bottom vents open, um, that's when I had more pest problems. Um, like I had um, aphids, and I had some little caterpillar things, I like to eat tomatoes and stuff like that. You know and I didn't have them um, until I, I had those bottom vents open, um, as well as a mouse, um, which I could have had screens on there, uh, but I didn't. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely would use a shade cloth instead. Um, also, uh, you get a lot of condensation on the glazing. Um, I didn't have time to really get something set up or planned very well for that. So along that knee wall, um, it's, it's impressive the amount of moisture that condenses on that um, and, and drains down there. So having a plan for what to do with that would have been nice. Um, I would change the roof structure too. 
I had the upper vents were vertical because I was really concerned about snow, um, maybe blocking them or something. Uh, but it, if I were to do it again, I would build those doors into uh, the north roof structure because it's sloped enough with the steel roof that you don't have um, any sort of snow accumulation um, on there. So um, that's I would do that because then I could uh, make the construction of the structure simpler. Um, it's it's a long ways up there when you're working on those doors and stuff, and uh, there really doesn't need to be that much height. Um, yeah, and you'd have a little bit less heat loss uh, with a uh, without that structure up there. Uh, so, you know, some things that'd be interesting to investigate further. Um, uh, like the, the Chinese structures have is the uh, insulating curtains. Um, I think uh, I think that has a lot of potential because there's still a lot of heat loss that occurs through that glazing. Um, so having a reliable automatic uh, insulating curtain is would be awesome because you would, would really reduce a lot of heat loss and probably be able to run um, a lot warmer temperatures um, throughout the winter uh, with the curtain. Um, you know, alternative structures, biggest problem, there's not enough space, it's too small. Um, you know, going to uh, something bigger, of course, would be nice. Um, I'd look more at uh, more different layouts for the climate battery tubes uh, for other size structures. Um, hopefully the guidelines I have are, are helpful for you, at least if you're doing a smaller one, uh, but uh, definitely your, your layouts would, would end up changing a, a good bit for a, a larger structure. Um, yeah, more space, it's too small. Uh, let's see, questions. We've got one question from Anne-Marie. If the north wall was at least two feet of earth, could you run the tubes through that and use it as a climate battery? Yeah, that's a great idea. Actually, I think that would be would be neat to investigate. Uh, once I was reading more on the research of the Chinese solar greenhouses, um, that, that's the limitation that they find in a lot of the research papers, right? Is it because that, uh, earth of uh, sand or whatever storage battery they have, it's, it's fully passive. Um, only so much heat can conduct through it um, in and out each day. Um, so if you were to run your air tubes um, through that, that would give you more mass um, to store, store more heat. Um, let's see, and Michael asks, how much would you say you were able to grow? Uh, that's a pretty general question uh, as to how much, but uh, I guess I'll cover next some of the different th plants and things that I did have growing, um, but I did not weigh like the, the weight of tomatoes and stuff, um, which that might be something that uh, would be nice to do too, to, to track that and see how it, how it changed. But I really didn't know what I was doing for tomatoes when I started growing those. Um, any other questions in the greenhouse? Because the next section, uh, we'll be talking about uh, some of the different stuff uh, we have and or are growing. Oh yeah, we got two people asking the same question. What was the total cost? Um, so uh, the total cost uh, for for me was about just under twenty thousand um, yeah, dollars. I did most of the work myself, uh, or with uh, with friends and family that helped with that. Um, so I didn't have really any labor costs other than I, I didn't pour the, the foundation myself. Um, so yeah, so it was just, just under 20,000. The uh, deep winter greenhouse folks, they do have uh, some some data on that of what those have costed. And they have found, you know, it's, it's highly variable based on your contractor and um, what their labor costs are too. So. So that uh, that can add a big uh, big variable into that. Uh, so yeah, so if you're still awake, we'll uh, we'll talk about some plants because uh, uh, everybody everybody here probably wants to know about plants because that's why we do this. Uh, oh, we got a couple more questions. Julie asks, how many square feet of growing space did you say you had? Um, you know that's. It depends a lot on what you're growing. Um, you do have to plan for some walkway space. Um, so you know, I don't know, does the walkway space take up 
25%, depending on how tight you can squeeze around plants. And you know, if you're growing more tall things, um, you know, they take up more square feet. Uh, tomatoes would take up a particular amount of square feet, It'd be a lot different than say lettuce. Um, Jody Krogman asks, would you add a head house to your structure? Um, so by head house, do you mean like a packing shed or um, a little room for when you enter? Um, I, I'm not like uh, packing a lot of produce. Uh, some of the structures and designs out there will have what they call a packing shed attached, uh, which is is um, cooler and doesn't have uh, have any any heating from the climate battery in it, uh, where you can maybe store produce. Uh, if you are growing produce, that's that is a good good thing to do. Um, I I probably would put a small room on the the entrance way. Um, so you can have two doors um, on your entrance. I've always been a bit concerned, and maybe paranoid that, you know, the kids will run through and not close the door. Right? And I, I don't have any backup heat source in there. So that could be catastrophic. So, you know, having two doors um, would be a good thing there, as well as uh, I think someone mentioned, oh, using an Arduino or something to control the system. Um, if you have uh, electronics for controlling anything, you could keep them in that uh, that head house or that entrance room, um, so that they're not uh, bombarded by the level of humidity um, that uh, electronics inside the structure would be. That's something that uh, to be cautious with with uh, any sort of DC electronics in your greenhouse. They will corrode uh, and not uh, not last as long as. And so they might, if you can put them either outside of the building or in a control panel outside of the building. Um, Brent uh, asked if I grew directly in the soil or just in pots. I did both. And I'll show you some pictures of that. Next here, Jody asked, room to enter, prep room. Yeah, yep, yeah, okay. I think I got that answer correctly then. Okay, uh, let's see. We were gonna do uh, one more poll for pokes. Um, just kind of getting feedback on the, the content and stuff. So I, folks can feel free to take some time and go through that poll when you, when you get a chance. Um, do I use any kind of cold boxes? I did not have any cold boxes um, inside. So uh, this slide here covers some, uh, some of the things we're growing, some tomatoes. Uh, see this picture here actually was from January 4th. Uh, what it looked like. Um, I had a couple of tomatoes that I've tried in here. These were really just seeds that I had laying around. I spent so much time work on building the structure up until I got it done that I didn't have a lot of seeds um, really planned out. Um, so these were just what I had on hand. So I planted some ponderosa reds, uh, sweetie and edox. Um, I started those seeds January 2nd. This is just right after the one year birthday of these, uh, or germination day, if, if uh, plants probably aren't born. Uh, so they're the germination days. Um, and so our observations, they're still producing tomatoes uh, over a year old. Um, you know, growth and production really slowed in that mid December timeframe. Um, you know, if you were doing production tomatoes, it, probably, you know, you wouldn't really plan on a lot of volume um, production after that point. Um, and the other thing, the ponderosas are uh, more of an outdoor heirloom garden tomato. Um, so I did see a lot of cracking and stuff on those um, with in, in the mid to late summer uh, when it was really just getting too hot uh, for too long in, inside the structure. So I'm trying a few different varieties uh, this year uh, to see how those do. Um, yeah, things I would differently just get them started a little bit earlier. Um, I could have had them in the ground um, sooner um, than I did last year if I had the plant started. Of course, you can't just go to the store and uh, pick up some plants uh, in January in our region. So uh, you need to, to plan to start those earlier or, or know a guy that's selling plants on Facebook in January. Um, so I did, I did plant, uh, plant those um, in the ground this year on, on February 3rd. Uh, they're looking nice. 
Um, one thing I, I just wasn't prepared for was how to properly trellis uh, tomatoes. Um, you can see a little bit in here, it ended up being utter chaos because uh, tomatoes, you know, um, indeterminate tomatoes grow on a vine continuously and um, they don't fruit or flower again from that same portion of the vine. So you, you prune off um, those um, those leaves and uh, just continue the vine growing uh, for the duration of the growing period. So um, that's something I've got a much better plan uh, for now that I know what not to do. Um, and then um, I'm doing all uh, grafted tomatoes um, this year because um, it's a thing, you know, when you when you're growing in the garden, it's really not too big of a deal because it kind of, you know, you got to three to four month life maybe. Um, but uh, when you're growing a plant for a year, um, it's worth it to put a little bit more um, into uh, that plant because um, it's going to produce a lot better for you if you can use a, uh, a rootstock uh, for tomatoes. So if you haven't heard of grafting tomatoes, uh, you can read up on that. That's kind of a, a neat thing that I hadn't, uh, I didn't know about. Uh, but tomatoes did really good. Let's see, next slide. Here we go. Some other things we did. Uh, we did um, radishes, lettuces, broccolis, cauliflowers. Um, I really started these uh, in in that January time frame because I knew those would be things um, they could grow the, the lettuces and stuff, they'll germinate in, in temperatures, soil temperatures in the 40s. Um, so that's definitely something you can do well in a, a cool area. Uh, the broccoli and cauliflowers, I was also expecting for, for cool temperatures. Um, so I, I started some of those and uh, put those in the ground. Um, I did some turmeric, uh, which is definitely not a, a cool uh, temperature crop, but something that we, we can't grow outside in our climate. Um, and some peas and green beans. Um, so we've got a few different pictures here of these throughout the time. Um, this is this is our, our lettuces and how we had those laid out um, in the ground. Um, the radishes and stuff were over here. Um, and the lettuces did really, really well. Um, I would say that was a wonderful blessing, especially especially when uh, when COVID came around and. Um, we had uh, as much lettuce, fresh lettuce that was really delicious that uh, as we could eat. We had a lot of salads. Um, the cauliflowers, I planted the uh, this deep purple variety and they were beautiful. They did really well um, in the greenhouse. Um, the broccoli, I would say it was kind of average. Um, and the Brussels sprouts that we planted, they actually never produced sprouts. Uh, it, it seemed like it was too warm in there. And so they, they never Brussels sprouted. I don't know if there's a better term for that. If, if uh, we had our horticulturist on with us tonight, she'd probably know. Um, you can kind of see here too, the effect of the knee wall on the shadows. So this region here um, in, in March is, is getting, isn't getting the direct sunlight uh, that areas back here are. So it's kind of interesting, the, the areas with the, the prime sunlight uh, in the winter time um, end up being um, the areas that are getting, are actually below the roof, the, the shaded part of the structure uh, during the summertime. Um, so it's, it's interesting that the light patterns are, are, are a little bit different than a regular greenhouse. Um, yeah, things I do differently was uh, start any, any brassicas uh, much sooner, uh, which is what we did, we planted them. I think just before November, we put them in the ground. Um, yeah, use less space on vegetables. Um, one of the things the deep winter greenhouse um, folks do is um, grow lettuces in gutters because, because they're using a, a rock bed um, climate battery, they can't grow in the ground. And the gutters are a popular uh, method for getting a, a pretty good amount of space. They're, they're light enough, you can move them around, but yet they have enough surface area that you can um, plant stuff in. So we tried that um, this winter and those are looking really nice. This year's picture from quite a while ago. Um, they're nice and big and bushy. Um, yeah, they do well in those. Uh, let's see, we've got a question from Sharon Misfelt. Do you have pollinators or bees come and go out of the greenhouse? 
That is a good question. Um, so everything I have on this slide here is really vegetables that don't need pollination. Um, so pollination is definitely something you want to um, be cognizant of whatever you're growing and how it pollinates. And I'll cover some of those issues a little bit later. Um, but no, I didn't really have, I didn't definitely did not have any honeybees um, coming in and out of the greenhouse. Honeybees don't like going in greenhouse structures because uh, the polarization of the glazing messes with their eyes is what I understand. Um, so if you do um, want pollinators, you would get like bumblebees or something along those lines that uh, are a little bit different. I did happen to capture some bumblebees and put them in here, but they didn't really do anything. But it was exciting catching bumblebees. Uh, let's see. Jody asked, how did you amend your soil inside the greenhouse, compost, do you fertilize? Do you bring in native soil and amend it? Do you rotate crops? Um, yeah, so for the first year, I, I used the soil that I had. I was really lucky with this location. It is basically topsoil as far as I can dig. Um, so I, even when I, I excavated the structure, I didn't have to separate uh, the topsoil from the other stuff. Um, just because of the, the specific site. Um, but I, I have animals and stuff on the farm too for, for composting um, in the future. So I, I didn't really do uh, much for soil amendments the first year. I hadn't, hadn't grown produce in this area before. This actually was more kind of a shelter belt. Um, so it was very, very, uh, very nice soil. Uh, the turmeric here, I put a kind of a yellow on this. It, it was kind of mediocre. I didn't feel like for the space that it, it took uh, that the, the amount of turmeric was, was maybe really worth it. Um, I don't know, it, it, maybe some of it's too, we don't know what to do with turmeric that well. Um, so I have seen a lot of folks uh, will grow turmeric in pots. I think that might be interesting because then you could you could move it outside during the summertime too and uh, then it bring it in and uh, leave that space for growing other things. Ah, let's see, some other things. Uh, Apocalypse scorpion peppers. These guys did awesome. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing with these guys. I let the children pick seeds out of the catalog and they thought these looked cool. <laughs> so we. So we, we had some of those, I planted them. Um, these are a super hot pepper variety. Um, so they're a capsicum chinense. Um, so something interesting with these that I didn't realize is they're pretty slow to produce. So if you're growing them outside in our climate, they won't really have enough time to produce a lot of peppers. Um, but in the greenhouse, they were producing peppers. I picked uh, the last ones in any significant quantity um, on January 6th. So that's, that's quite something. Um, and I, I also learned a lot that uh, peppers are, uh, are a perennial, not an annual. Uh, we only know them as an annual that you have to replant every year, uh, but they are, they're just very frost sensitive. So um, when the temperatures fall uh, below 45 or in the 40s for an extended period of time, they'll start to go dormant um, and then when it warms up, they'll come back. So, um, so now they're they're pretty pretty fairly dormant. They still have some leaves and some buds on the top, but I expect here as as we go through February and temperatures are warmer again, um, we'll start to see some growth on them. So they can uh, in in their native areas they'll live uh, five to ten years. So that's kind of interesting. I didn't know about that. Um, another thing I did so. So peppers are uh, wind pollinated, um, as are the tomatoes. So um, they'll do pretty good with pollination just with the uh, fans blowing around um, to the, the pollination question. Um, but I planted some of these, or just one plant actually, because um, it was a it was a gift someone got for free. Uh, these they're um, really a, a sort of cucumber. Um, so. It, the plant grew extremely well. I really covered the entire north wall as much as I could uh, prune it. Um, and, but they, 
pollination was a little bit of a challenge on these guys. So um, I did have some insects that came in and pollinated them, um, not bees. I noticed uh, there was some moths, maybe the same moths that were eating the tomatoes, maybe a mixed blessing, um, except tomatoes taste better than these things. So, um, but uh, I, I did notice when, when I had pollinators around, uh, they did produce, uh, produce pretty decently. Um, so, but that is definitely the challenge um, if you're growing in a structure like this, is you wanna make sure you either um, are growing things that don't need pollinators or you're growing things that you know how to pollinate them um, yourself. Um, so that can always be kind of challenging to find that information out there too um, beforehand. I, I wouldn't grow these again um, because I don't really like to eat them. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, so one of the things that are maybe uh, a little less common, um, Moringa, we uh, had uh, had a few uh, Moringa trees. Uh, Moringa trees are grown in Africa, India, uh, the Philippines, and they're they're grown to eat the leaves. Um, mostly the leaves, uh, they also get fruit pods and things. Um, and they did really, really awesome. Um, I started them from seed uh, back in January and by 10 months old, they were over 10 foot tall. Um, so I needed to, to eat them more so they didn't get so big. Um, so yeah, so what I what I had read on this was that they would start to go dormant when the temperatures, average temperatures fell below 70, but um, it actually still has green growth on it um, through January here. It's, I'd say now in February, it's it's semi-dormant. Uh, some of the, the leaves have have, uh, have fallen off, um, but it still has some of the new, new growth on it. Um, so it's done way better than I was expecting. It's a, it's a zone nine to 10 uh, plant. Um, Monstera deliciosa, I've got uh, several of these guys. Uh, you might know these as a, a house plant, um, usually called Swiss cheese plant, sold in stores as a, a house plant. Uh, they're a zone 10 or 12. Um, and they actually produce a fruit here that looks like this. Uh, that's absolutely delicious. Um, and they've done really well too. They're, they're nice because they're a, a low light uh, plant. So I actually like, keep them on the floor under my tables that have other pots and plants on them um, so that they're not getting, getting sunburnt. I don't know if it would be possible um, in this environment to get them to fruit. But usually if you're growing them as a house plant, you can't, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if my environment would work for that or not, um, but uh, they're definitely pretty. Um, some other things, oh, I was gonna, I was gonna do a quiz on this and I forgot. Um, my background uh, on my presentation here um, is uh, passion fruit vine. This guy's huge uh, covering uh, half of the north wall. Uh, passion fruit are absolutely delicious. This guy's grown vigorously. And this photo here actually was, um, I took this the day that I did uh, the presentation last week. Uh, so it's very beautiful and green uh, with the, the temperatures uh, that's been in the greenhouse. Um, they're a zone 10 to 12 uh, plant and they produce passion fruit, um, look like this. Uh, this one is, uh, is uh, Passiflora edulis uh, Frederick's variety. So it's self pollinate, it can self pollinate uh, but it hasn't it hasn't bloomed yet, and uh, it will it will most likely need uh, hand pollination to to get it to pollinate. But they're they're pretty easy to hand pollinate, except it's so tall, um, so that won't be super fun. Um, I have a bunch of uh, super dwarf Cavendish bananas. Um, they're a zone nine to ten. Um, they've really taken a beating um, in January. It, it you know definitely hasn't froze in there, but just the cooler temperatures um, have been really hard on them. They don't like that at all. So I wouldn't say that this particular variety is probably not a very good one um, for the structure. They're just plants I already had um, around um, beforehand. Uh, so if I, if I wanted to do bananas, um, there's I would research bananas that uh, would do better in, in this, uh, this growing environment. 
Uh, let's see, other things. Um, black Zapotes. I've got a bunch of these guys in pots. So I sell, I sell these guys online and they're looking really nice. Um, so that's these. This is uh, actually uh, related to um, the persimmon. If, if you're familiar with persimmons, pers the uh, American persimmon can grow up to the Nebraska region, uh, but black sapote is uh, zone 10 to 11. Um, they have not been hindered by our, our cooler December and January temperatures. Um, I've got uh, several uh, loquats, uh, grafted ones that I grafted, uh, big gym on. Um, they're a zone eight to 10. Um, they are doing really great, of course, because uh, zone eight has been uh, much warmer than zone eight in there. Um, so they're very happy. Uh, let's see, other things, we've got a lot of things. Um, uh, Patanga or uh, Suriname cherry. Uh, this here's actually one that uh, I got fruited. Um, oh, we got a question about, do you grow white sapote? I would love to try the black ones. Are they as creamy as the white ones? Oh, I probably should talk about. So black sapote are also called um, chocolate pudding fruit. Uh, you can see the, the texture and the color here is, is very much like chocolate pudding. Uh, unfortunately, the flavor is not. It's a pretty mild, bland uh, flavor, uh, but they definitely look cool. Um, but uh, yeah, I do have some white sapote. I think I have some pictures in here of them. Maybe not. Um, Tangas, yeah, this is actually one that uh, one that set fruit. These are they're pretty small yet, so I was pretty happy that I had one that even was blooming and, and fruiting already. Um, Caracuelo is a, a Garcinia. Um, they're looking really nice. Um, I have uh, several Canistel, um, or sometimes they're called uh, egg fruit. Uh, here's a picture of what the egg fruit looks like. Uh, I also have a lot of toads in here, so. This is this is actually the, the plant behind it, but that's the picture I had. Um, and uh, yeah, some longans. Uh, they're they're looking good yet. Um, a bunch of those things. Um, let's see, anonias. Uh, I I'm a big fan of anonisae of uh, many types. Um, so I've got uh, a a lot of cherimoyas. Um, some that. Uh, I've got various uh, varieties grafted onto, and they look really good um, throughout the winter here. Um, I did have some of my first blossoms on them in the spring, um, just after I grafted, but um, I, I plucked those off because they were too too young of grass to, to fruit yet. But hopefully, hopefully this spring they'll they'll uh, flower in quantities enough that I can uh, get them hand pollinated. This is what a, a cherimoya looks like. Um, there's also a bunch of other um, anona say that I have um, sugar apples uh, here, anona squamosa. Um, they're they're not looking as good, and neither the sour sops. They they actually like a warmer climate, so I'm not sure. We'll see. They've they've gone dormant and dropped their leaves. I'm not sure um, if they'll they'll make it through the winter or not. We shall see. Um, Adamoyas are are looking good. Um, I have some Adamoyas that are grafted on the Cherimoyas. Those look really good. Um, they're, they're a cross between the uh, Cherimoya and the Sugar Apple. Um, if you have, here's a question. If you have toads, do you have snakes? Um, no, I don't have any snakes. And the reason I have toads is because uh, the, the summer when we were, were building this was the summer before last summer. And it was so extremely wet that year. We just had toads everywhere. And so they kind of just were <laughs> living in the ground uh, when I built it. And so they're still living there. And um, they're, uh, they, they do eat pests um, in pretty reasonable quantities. Um, so you can tell when, uh, when they've gotten a lot of the bugs eaten, they start looking thin and then have the kids uh, exile some of the toads out of the greenhouse if it's summertime. Um, another question, Debbie says, I'm really impressed by the variety of unusual fruits you're growing. Nice, yes, yes, they are awesome. There's so many things that uh, we don't even know exist. Um, let's see, a couple, couple more. Oh, the white sapote did make it in here. Um, here we've got uh, white sapote. I have 
I have two different plants. Um, this one here has two varieties grafted on it. And um, the, the white sapote are looking really good. Um, they're a, a zone nine and 10. Um, and uh, both of the varieties that I have grafted onto this one here, you can just see one, um, Sue Bell and Fernan or what I have is interesting. Um, one of those varieties has uh, dropped its leaves and is, is, is just dormant. Um, it's got nice buds on it and stuff yet to come back. And the other one is still still green. So it's interesting the different varieties, you know, have different, uh, different uh, cold hardiness or different um, um, dormancy temperatures anyway. Um, another one that I was excited about is uh, Naranjila. Um, this is a sol solanum, so it's in the same uh, same genus as tomato plants are and um, stuff like that. So um, these guys are um, pretty cool looking, fuzzy, spiky things, um, and um, you can kind of see some not ripe uh, fruits on here. And um, here's some. These are I think I took this picture a couple of weeks ago. They're they're getting close to ripe. Um, they're supposed to taste like citrus. I haven't, I haven't had one yet because uh, they have a, a long, uh, long growing time. Um, and because uh, the ones, this one here is actually one I had outside in the garden and I dug it up um, and brought it inside. Um, I, it took me a while to figure out how to get them to pollinate. That was really um, the struggle I had with the one that was in the greenhouse. I couldn't find um, information on a line just using the paintbrush. Uh, technique it was was not sufficient, um, but uh, I did figure it out uh, around about the August time. Um, so I do have a bunch of them set on the, the plants in the greenhouse now. Um, they're just farther behind the one that I had uh, outdoors. So yeah, so that's that's everything everything on the uh, plants. Let's see. Some questions from Dana. What are some future things you'd like to try growing in the greenhouse that you haven't tried yet? Um, well, I've got a lot of seed packets. Um, we'll be doing um, some more uh, varieties of peppers. Um, I have um, seeds for a few different varieties of different types of solanum um, that uh, normally wouldn't uh, be able to grow in our region uh, that I plan to try. Um, yeah, so hopefully I get the passion fruit to, to, to flower. Um, if, if they don't flower um, at some point, uh, that, uh, that won't be very good. Um, does anybody have any other questions? It's, that's about to the end. So, all right. Did we, did we get our poll, our poll at the end? Did, uh, did we get that done? We do have the poll, yes. We're okay. sharing those results now. Can you see those, Shannon? Yeah, yep. So we had, see the first question was, how, how would you prefer to learn more about solar greenhouses? Uh, focused live webinars, so 62% said they like that. 51% uh, said they'd like recorded videos you can watch anytime. Uh, focused on specific topics. Uh, yeah, so that's good. I might uh, do some of that. Um, yeah, and then read about it. Uh, let's see, as a result of this presentation, I've been, uh, let's see, 64% had increased knowledge of the fundamentals of passive solar greenhouses. Uh, let's see, I learned information to help me extend my growing season was 13%. And I'm planning to build my own passive solar greenhouse was 23%. And the third question is, what aspects of passive solar greenhouses would you like to learn more about? Um, see, 66% say how to build one. Uh, so I definitely have millions of pictures of that. Um, <laughs> how to lay out size manifolds and select fans. Yep, that's, that's another good one. I, that uh, was just too big of a topic to, to capture here. Um, and detailed design of the structures. Good one, and how to wire thermostats and electrical aspects of 28%. So, yeah, so very good. Thanks everyone for attending. Hopefully, uh, this is info is good. I can.
feel free. Let's see, yeah, make sure I set this to the last slide. You can uh, make sure you can uh, email me if you have questions or other specific things you want to know about um, or have suggestions for other future webinar topics. Um, yeah, and you can follow us on uh, on our Facebook page. I post random things about how things are going. So, yeah, check Thank it out. you, Shannon. Thank you so much. On behalf of the South Dakota Specialty Producer Association and the South Dakota Master Gardener Program, we'd like to thank you, Shannon Mitchell Connells, for sharing your expertise with us this evening. Once tonight's recording is processed, we will post this to the SDSU Extension YouTube page and we'll email all registered participants a link to both recorded sessions. Feel free to visit sdspecialtyproducers.org and extension.sdstate.edu for future learning opportunities. And Shannon has also shared his contact information on the slide on the screen as well. Thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. Have a good night.